Corinthians was written to, had clearly been taught about the coming of Jesus. Uh, we know they did because you just read that passage and it wasn't, uh, you can tell, he, they already knew something about it. In fact, they, along with the Apostle Paul, were under the impression that the coming of Jesus was something that would happen soon, any time. That's, that's the way they thought of it. That's how they looked at it. And so this church was initially very excited about that prospect, so much so that they weren't even, it didn't even enter their minds that they would live long enough to see any Christians die. That's how, that's how much they thought that the coming of Jesus would be that soon. So that when uh, things started happening and time went on as the world does go on, when some of them did die, it caught them off guard. They were like, what's the deal? What's going to go? Wait, what happened? You know, and what about the coming of Jesus? And, and, and are they going to miss out on that? And, and that's, that's, how, that's how much they thought the coming of Jesus was some sort of an imminent thing. And so they wondered about that and they worried about that. And the Apostle Paul wrote to them to talk to them about those things. And that's what this whole section is about. Uh, verse 13 again says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. When, when the Apostle Paul understood where they were coming from and what their worries were, he wrote to them saying, you need more understanding about these things. You need more understanding about the depth of believers and about the coming of Jesus. Without the right understanding on this subject, we as Christians could could have a mind that is hopeless regarding the sorrows of life as someone who doesn't know Jesus at all. That's why it's so important to have an understanding on this subject. Notice that Paul didn't say that the death of their loved ones, uh, who, the death of people who believed in Jesus but had died, he didn't say that it wasn't a painful and sad and sorrowful thing. It certainly is. But he wanted them to know that the kind of sorrow that it brings it should be nothing like the kind of sorrow that happens uh, with somebody who doesn't know the Lord. It doesn't need to be a hopeless sorrow. In fact, uh, that sorrow is utterly different than the world because despite the reality of it, people die, people close to us, we don't get to see them in this side of heaven anymore. Uh, we have a certain hope, an absolute hope in the face of all of it, the resurrection our, our resurrection and the return of Jesus. And so, but apart from the resurrection and apart from the return of Jesus, apart from the rapture of the church, the sorrows of this life really don't have much, have any hope of being righted. Everyone dies. That's how it ends if, there's, if none of these things are true. That's not a good ending. That's a bad ending, right? But we know as Christians that's not how it all ends. And so, uh, if, if that's how it ended, everyone who ever we lo loved and care about who was a believer, they would just be gone. And that would be the end of the story, and that would be that. But that's not how it is. For believers in Jesus, every sorrow, every sorrow, every pain, every struggle, every difficulty, every single one of them is temporary. It, and, and, and even losing people, even the death of someone close to us, of loved ones, it's temporary, the loss of that. The, the only reason any Christian would ever sorrow deeply this, to the level of somebody who doesn't know the Lord is either they're ignorant of what God has promised or, or they don't believe it. And, and God doesn't want that. He wants us, not only does he want us not to be not ignorant, but he wants us to, to be very clear in, in about what's going to happen. Jesus is coming the dead will be raised and we will be with him those are the, some of the key points in this passage death will not have the last word for us and and neither will any of the junk that's going on around us right now none of it will and so the certainty of jesus coming needs to be an established part of our belief system it needs to be something that is not just a side thing that we talk about once in a while, maybe, you know, have a prophecy update. It needs to be something that is right up front with all the other stuff that we believe that God uh, says in his word. Anytime my kids have gone away for, for a period of time, I miss them a lot. You know, and they've, you know, they're, they're, they've gone to college and they've been gone for months and I'm bummed out when they're gone. I miss them like immediately. 
but I, I'm not nearly as bummed out as I would be if I thought that they like, were going to be gone for decades or something like that. Or if, worse than that, if I'd never see them again. I look forward to, I, okay, they're gone, but I'm going to see them again. And, and God wants us hopeful like that. He wants us thinking like that. Nothing here is ultimate. Nothing here is ultimate. It's not a hopeless circumstance that we're in. The sorrows of this life are not the last word. Verse 14 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So here Paul expands on why we're not hopeless about those who died in Jesus. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and as Christians we do believe that. In fact, that's what it means to be a Christian. You can't be a Christian without believing that. You, we believe in our heart that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, because of our sins, in place of our sins. And he rose again from the dead. And, and Paul says, if you believe that, and really it means since you believe that, he says, here's something else you need to believe along with that. Then also believe this, that when Jesus comes, he's going to bring with him, he's not coming alone. He's going to bring with him the people that already died who were believers. And, and now, as a side note and a huge side note, that reminds us of something extremely important. The dead in Christ are already with him. You can't bring someone with you if they're not with you. He's bringing them with him because he's, they're with him. And they're already with him. And they're going to come when he comes. And, and so when, when he comes in the rapture, that means that those people who are now with him, they're coming back. They're going to get bodies again. Right now they're with him, uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And they're going to, and they're going to be with him again. And, and they're going to be raised. And we're going to be upgraded. And that means that the coming of Jesus in the rapture is the end of death as we know it. That's what happens. And, and, and really, that's something that has to happen. Because the re, why, is, why do we have death in the world? Because of sin. The wages of sin is death. Death, by, by one man, sin entered the world, and, by, and uh, through sin, death entered into the world. So that's why we die. If, if we just died and went to heaven, and our body stayed here, and we never got a new body, that'd be good. It'd be better than being here. But that wouldn't mean that would that would mean that sin won a part of the deal. That the devil won a part of the deal. That he won that part that says, "Oh, I'm going to make them physically die." And God's not going to let sin win any part of the deal. So our bodies will be redeemed. We'll be raised that way. Phys if we just died a physical death, but lived spiritually in heaven forever with no bodies. God didn't, that wasn't a complete salvation. All, everything about us is going to be saved, including our bodies. Uh, and so that's what's going to happen. And the rapture will see the end of death as we know. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55. It says, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? That's, that's another description of what happens at the rapture, that, that death has a time limit for us. And just as this world's sorrows are temporary, so is the reign of death. When Jesus died and rose again, he defeated death. And, and when he comes for the church, we're going to experience that victory ourselves. We haven't fully experienced that victory yet. But we're going to. And, and so death for now and for, you know, since the fall, since the garden, death has been on an unstoppable rampage. And, and, uh, but when Jesus comes, that ends um, for us, for believers. And then verse 15 says, For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who have already died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up 
together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So here what Paul explains to us is how both the dead and the living Christians, every one, every single Christian is going to experience the coming of Jesus. Nobody's going to miss out on them. That was their concern. What about those people that already died? They're going to miss out on this. No, they're not. No Christian will miss out on this. Not one. And uh, notice he says, some will live until the coming of the Lord. They'll live to see the return of Jesus. They'll live until that day. Despite the great efforts of the devil to wipe out the church, and the devil's been trying to wipe out the church for a really long time. This, 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 trying to, this idea of trying to shut churches down and tell them they can't sing and tell us that we can't do that. This isn't new. This is the devil's deal. He's been doing this forever. He's been doing it all over the place. There's places around the world, we know this, that have way more harder time to freely worship than we do right now. And yet, they're still singing they're still gathering. They're still praising. And, and yet, and not, and not only that, but the church is going to survive all of it, every single one of them. Until Jesus comes back, the church will survive. And then it says he himself will descend to the earth. Um, keep in the back of your mind, because the question comes up and we're not doing this study right now. How do we know the rapture's a different uh, period, a different event than the, the coming of Jesus. Keep in the back of your mind that it says at the end of the, the age, he'll, in, in uh, the Gospels, Jesus said that he'll send the angels to, to uh, gather, gather uh, the elect. It doesn't say that here. Here it says he himself will come. So that's a different event. This is, this is the rapture we're talking about. It says he himself will uh, descend to the earth. Here's what it says in uh, Acts 1, 10 and 11 about uh, the return of Jesus. This is after he re uh, resurrected and he was about to ascend, or when he ascended into heaven. It says, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him going into heaven. He's coming back the same way. Here's what it says in Revelation 1.7. Look, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Now, the, the thing about that is, is that he's going to come that way both at the rapture and when he returns. So again, this is all happening the same way. Jesus will come the same way that he left he'll come in the clouds he'll come in glory and he's going to come in two main phases the second phase is when he comes and defeats the antichrist in this christ rejecting world in revelation 19 but before that our passage here talks about how he's going to rapture his church he's going to be he's going to descend there's going to be he's going to shout some sort of trumpet call a blast, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's resurrection. That's what the Thessalonians were wondering about. And then Christians still alive, and we're hoping that's us, will go next. That's the rapture. And it says they'll be caught up together with them, the ones that raised, in the clouds. That word caught up is an important Bible word. In Greek, it's harpazo. In the Latin, it's rapturos. And that's where we get the word rapture. You're not going to find the word rapture in any English Bible. But it's easier to say rapture than it is to say the catching up. Don't you agree? It's easier to say rapture. You can call it whatever you want. He's coming. We're getting caught up. You can call it snatched away. You can call it I can't wait. You can call it whatever you want. He's coming. He's taking us. And if you don't like it that the word rapture is not in the Bible, get a Latin Bible and then it'll be in your Bible. And so if someone says that, just tell them, get a Latin Bible. And the, and the word means, caught up, rapture means suddenly or even violently snatched away. 
In 1 Corinthians, it says this will happen in chapter 15. It says this will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I don't know what a twinkle of an eye is, but I'm pretty sure it's faster than a blink of an eye. So it's quick. All of a sudden, every believer, dead or alive, will be with him. And we'll all experience it. He's coming for his church. He's going to call us up. He's going to snatch us away. Verse, the second part of verse 17 says, And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So as awesome as I'm, I'm excited about the snatching away part. But as much as that, there's something that's even because, I mean, I'm ready. There is nothing I need to happen. And biblically, I don't think there's anything that needs to happen either. I got there's nothing. I don't I'm ready right now. Let's go. And and. Uh, he, but he decides when we're ready. So if we're if we're not going, that means we still have something to do. But. As awesome as that is, that we could just imagine, just in a moment, no more smoke-filled skies, no more rioting in the streets, no more, you know, coronavirus, no more lying news media, no more disgustingly angry political climate. Just, we're just with him. I'm ready. And, but, but. That's not the best part about just being, okay, I'm out of it. I'm above it. it we, went, uh, we went to the mountains last week, and it was, it was awesome because I was kind of, you're kind of away from, it's just good to get away for one. But like away from what? Just everything. Just kind of a break. We were still in the world where it's all going on, but it was just lighter there. You know, it just wasn't so much focus constant. You can see, I even saw a guy in the, grocery store not wearing a mask and nobody was yelling at him for not wearing a mask you know try doing that around here you're gonna get screamed at sorry man it was an accident you know you, sometimes you forget but but as much as it's nice to just get a, away and above everything the greater part is the last phrase it says thus which means in this manner or then or in this way what we will always be with the Lord. That's when it happens. That's when we'll never be parted from him again. When the rapture happens, the church will be united together, not only in Jesus, we're already united in Jesus, that the Bible says, but we'll be united forever with Jesus. We'll never, there'll never be a time where we'll, we'll be apart with him, from him. We'll be with him forever. Now, the, the Bible already teaches that Right now, the moment a believer dies, we go to be with the Lord. And we're glad for that. Praise God for that. But this verse speaks of the body of Christ as a whole, the entirety. As a whole, together. It says, we, we as a whole, the entire church will always be with Jesus at this moment. Right now, some of the church is absent from the body and present with the Lord. And some of the church, us, are absent from the Lord and present in our bodies. And even right now, some of us are absent from the church and present at home. And some of us are present at home and ab or absent from home and present from the church. You get, we're not all united together in the same place right now. We're united. But when the rapture happens, we're all going to be together. We're all going to be with the Lord together in new bodies, never to be apart from him or each other again. Now, I don't know exactly how that looks. Does that mean we're in close proximity? Probably not. I'm pretty sure heaven's bigger than here. That's how I think of it. But we'll never be separated again. Every, we're all going to be there. Verse 18 says, Therefore, in light of all that, comfort one another with these words. So the Apostle Paul is telling this young church, and this is considered to be one of the first books written in the New Testament. So this is a young church full of new believers. And that's cool because that means he taught young new believers about the coming of Jesus. It wasn't like, oh, you got to wait till your fourth year of college to learn about the coming of... No, man, learn that stuff now, right away. Know it. Get it solid in your mind. And he, he told them that you need to know these things and comfort each other with them. Isn't this, I mean, believe it. If you believe this, if you can get this and believe it, isn't this comforting truth? We're supposed to talk about this. 
This is one of our points of comforting each other. When? Whenever you need comfort. Whenever somebody needs comfort. To remind them. To look forward to it. To encourage and comfort and energize. And, and look, we live in crazy times. But it's not only crazy times. From a worldly perspective, that's probably all it is. This is either just crazy times. I hope we make it through it. But from the biblical Christian perspective, these are exciting times. Because everything about it shows, if nothing else, if nothing else, and I don't know because I don't know when he's coming, and we'll get to that in a minute. But if nothing else, we're closer than we've ever been to his coming and the Bible likens the times approaching his coming to labor pains, to contractions. And I don't know about you, but this is a big one. Doesn't this feel like a big contraction? <laughs> it's a good way to describe 2020. It's a big contraction. And, and, and so the contraction tells you what? Something good's going to happen. So we're close. And the rapture of the church is certain. And, and he says, look, just as much as you know and believe that Jesus died and rose again, know and believe he's coming. That is, in other words, what he's, he's putting that truth, that doctrine, that teaching, as he's putting it right next to the everybody knows how important the death and resurrection of Jesus is if you're a Christian at all hopefully you've learned that immediately and he's putting this teaching that Jesus is coming back right next to it going this is important too you need to get, have this down as much as you have that down and if you don't well now's the time to do that and so the rapture of the church is certain Jesus is coming he's going to take us home it's imminent. We believe it's imminent. Not everybody believes that. Some people think, you know, it's going to happen at a different time. We think it could happen at any moment. From our, our reading of the way we teach the Bible here and the way we look at it, we think there's nothing else that needs to happen biblically. We're not waiting for some other five things to happen. We're, we think it could happen right now. And then he's going to come and judge the world. And then we're going to come back with him and he's going to establish his kingdom. But before that, he's going to rapture his church to bring us to what we studied about last week. Remember, I'm preparing a place for you so that you can be with me. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. So he just lays out, he had just laid out the reality of Jesus coming. And this is our great hope and our longing. So much so that we, it's a point of comfort. But now he wants to talk about what everybody wants to talk about. And that's when. When? The time frame of his coming. That's always the question comes up. And it's natural that we would want to know when. I want to know. And God knows that we would want to know. But the Lord has determined that he's not going to tell us exactly when. He's going to tell us how we can know we're getting close. And, and that's what he's going to tell us. So he gives us signs of the time but not a set calendar date or appointment. He tells us what the seasons will look like, but not where the clock will be. And, 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 he gives, and there's lots of places in the Bible where the seasons are laid out. Uh, Matthew 24, if you read Revelation, you can get an idea of, of the seasons. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, there's lots of places in the Bible that tell us what it's going to look like. It tells us, you know, if you want to know what's going to look like, look at the days of Noah. What it looked like during that time? It looked like that. Um, but he doesn't give us an exact time. Here's what here's what it says, and here's what Jesus said about it in Matthew 24, verse 36 and 37. He says, "But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven." So don't ask angels. 
<clears throat> but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so will also be the coming of the Son of Man. And then in verse 42 and 43 of that same chapter, Matthew 24, he says, Watch, Jesus again said, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this. Here's what you can know. You don't know when he's coming, but you can know that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. So that's what Jesus said about the times. You're not going to know exactly when, so you're going to have to pay attention all the time. And, and, and Paul implies that the church, he tells them all this, and when Paul says what he said in uh, um, verse, concerning the times and seasons in verse 1, he, he implies that the church in Thessalonica knew this. You know this perfectly well, he says. And so that's why I said earlier, Paul clearly taught them all these things when he was with them. And he, and he said, you know this about it. You know that the coming of the Lord will be like a thief in the night. Well, what's that like? What's it like when a thief comes? It's unannounced, without warning, without, you know, any kind of like, hey, I'm here. I'm about to rob you now. The thief doesn't do that. The thief comes without notice. And then he says in verse 3, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So he gives a, what he's given here is, yeah, you're not going to know exactly one, but here's a couple of indicators uh, to emphasize the idea of a sudden, unexpected coming of Jesus. P he says they're going to say peace and safety. Everyone's going to think that everything's fine. It's all good. We're all good. It'll all, it'll, everything's, we're going to, it's all going to work out. Everything's going to be fine. You know, business as usual. What they say now, what do they say now? Just, we got a new normal now. It's just this new normal. We're going to get through this new normal. We might. I don't know when Jesus is coming, but I think he's coming soon. And he says, it'll be like labor pains on a woman. When it happens, there will be nothing you can do to stop it. Any, I, any woman who ever had a baby, probably at some, many of them at least I've seen, have ex wanted, okay, I don't want to do this right now. Well, let's do this later. Pretty sure you might have said that one time out of the five. Sorry. <laughs> it's coming. And, and, and here's, here's the thing. Unexpected, nothing you can do about it. It's going to happen when it happens, when he's ready. And, through, and, yet, and that's what he said. He made it super clear. And he told, he t Jesus said that. Paul clearly taught the church in Thessalonica. You know this. I, told you, I taught you this about what Jesus said. And yet throughout history, there have been people who have tried over and over and over to tell us when he's coming. They know. I know it didn't say it in the Bible. We figured it out. There's been all these people that I, we got it all figured out. He didn't want them to know, but he wants us to know. And I'm here to tell you now. And there's just all these kooks have said that. And, and, and um, let me just tell you this. If you ever hear about or read about someone saying they know when, do yourself a favor and the rest of us. Because if you really buy into that, you're going to try to tell us. And just stop. <laughs> Don't listen to it. Just be ready all the time. That's what he had in mind. And, and we're to always be ready. And that's why, though we don't know exactly when, he, he gave us plenty of signs in the Bible so that we can see what the seasons look like. And that's what he says. That's why he says what he says next. He says, like a thief in the night, verse 4, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. He's coming as a thief in the night, but you don't need to be caught off guard um, and overtaken like he's a thief to you. The thief in the night idea is for everybody. We don't know exactly when, but it's only unpleasant because who wants a thief to come to their house at night? Nobody. Who wants Jesus to come anytime? I don't care how, when, me, everybody, hopefully. If you don't want him to come right now, something's wrong in your heart. You're holding on to something in the world. Because when he decides it's ready, 
and it's time, that means it's the best time. Even if you think, well, no, no, we still have this ministry and stuff to do. Well, do it now then. Do it now then. Get on it now. And, you know, I still need to, re- I want these people to be reached out to. Well, reach out to them now. And he says, but you're not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor of the darkness. And so the fact that we don't know the exact day of Jesus' coming doesn't mean we don't know anything about when he's coming. He said, you're not in the dark. We are not in the dark about it. Even though his coming will be like a thief, We don't need to be caught off guard. The reason the thief catches people off guard is because all the lights are out and they're asleep. And when all the lights are out, you can't see. And when you're asleep, you don't know what's going on. You're completely oblivious. And so they're able to just come in undetected, inconspicuous, unknown. They sneak, they hide. But here's, we're told two reasons Christians don't need to be caught off guard like that. And he says, we're not in darkness. For the Christian, if you're walking with the Lord and you're in your word, your life spiritually should be like all the lights in the house are on. Nobody can creep up on you. You're looking at the news. You're looking at the world going, man, if he doesn't come like today, I don't know, but... I'm just going to have to have my bags packed all the time. When, when the kids were little, we were teaching them. And I think, it, I can't remember if it was Hannah. It might have been Hannah. We were teaching them about how Jesus is coming. I think it was Hannah. And we put her in bed and we were praying and she had her shoes on. And we're like, why do you have your shoes on? And you said, because Jesus, you said Jesus is coming. I like that. Faith of a child. Have that. Think of it that way. We'll probably get new shoes in heaven, though, so you can probably go to bed without shoes on still. I don't know. But but our relationship with the Lord and our, our conversation with Him through His Word keeps the lights on. It keeps us aware. It helps us to... Um, Be able to see. I don't know the day or the hour, but I know the season. And the question arises, well, haven't lots of Christians throughout history thought this? Haven't lots of Christians throughout history, weren't they just convinced? Haven't tons of people, Pastor Chuck was convinced he would live to see. Of course, because that's how God wanted it. What would happen if he didn't make it that way? Everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people would slack off and go, I got plenty of time. I'll get ready when it's close. We just need that. We need that kind of motivation. We need that kind of, uh, but we don't need to be in the dark. We're not completely unaware. The one that's in the dark is the one that doesn't even believe he's coming or it could possibly happen in their lifetime, like the thief in the night. I don't need to lock my doors. I don't need to do any of that. Nobody's going to rob my house. And so we know he's coming. We don't know when, but we're not in the dark. And so we can watch. And he says more than just not being in the dark. He says, you're not, you are not of the dark. You are sons of light, of the light of the day, not of night or darkness. So not only are believers not in the dark, but we're not of the dark. What does that mean? What does it mean, sons of light, sons of the day? Well, when you're the child of someone or something, you have its nature, right? Uh, Jesus liked to call himself son of man because he identified as a human. He became a human. He had the nature of a human. You know, you have the nature of your parents, and so, so Paul was saying, you have the nature of light, not darkness. You're, you're not, we're not supposed to be living our lives as somebody in the dark. We're not supposed, that's why he brings up drunkenness as one of the ideas here. People get drunk in the dark. They know it's kind of a shameful activity, so they kind of hide it a little bit. In a corrupted culture, people hide it less. But we're not, that's not us. We're not asleep. We're not oblivious. We're looking. 
We're, this is how we're supposed to be. We're looking, we're, pay atten- we're paying attention, we're reading our Bibles, we're looking at the world, we're going, man, how could it not be close? And, and so, yeah, it might be the dead of night to everybody around us. Oh, you Christians talking about Jesus coming again. Every time things get crazy, you talk about Jesus coming, you know, and they don't pay it. So, yeah, it's the middle of the night for you, but that's not us. Only people who are Bible literate, Bible believing Christians are really going to be ready for his coming. And that's what he intends. Now, here's something that's really important, I think, for the times that we live in right now. For the last few years, and this is because I am connected to broader. I just know more people. I know lots of people. I know different churches. I know different ministries that are not in the same circles as us, but I just know people. And and there has been in the last few years, and this has probably happened more than once in church history, where there's been this talk and this push of Bible prophecy. I mean, we don't need to pay a lot of attention to it. There's so many different ideas about it. And And it's really just a side issue and we should just focus on like, you know, only focus on doing good deeds and and that kind of stuff. And and we don't need to bother with it. Nobody could really understand it. And there's just a lot of talk as it relates to that. And there's even those that take it further. Man, Jesus wasn't talking about a literal return. I know a pretty good sized church in Hayward that has a pretty good sized radio ministry where the pastor teaches that. Jesus isn't coming literally. He didn't mean that. It didn't mean literal. Well, tell the disciples that. Tell those angels that were standing there watching him ascend into heaven who said to the disciples, hey, don't trip out. The same Jesus that you just saw go, he's coming back the same way he went. And yet, there's a big push in that direction, and there has been. But the the, the Bible gives us all the light we need on this subject. All the information that God wants us to have, it's all in there. If we don't have it, he didn't want us to have it, but he's given us enough. And so we need to make sure to pay attention to it, to learn it, to get to know it, so that we can compare and look and watch. How do you know someone's coming down the road? Because I see their headlights. And, and, and we see the times and the seasons unfold and we know we're closer than closer and we ready ourselves. Verse 6 says, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And so we aren't in the dark about these things. We know it's happening. We know Jesus is coming. And even though we don't know exactly when, here is how we're supposed to live in light of it. Here's what we're supposed to do about it. Don't be asleep. Be watchful. In other words, live like it's daytime. Most people are awake during the day. You know, you got some people that work night shift, but most people are awake during the day. And what do you do when you're awake? You pay attention to things. You look around you. And and you're not oblivious. And you accomplish things. You do things. You get things done. And so this is a call for us to be aware. Part of Christian living a huge part of Christian living is not only to be paying attention to his coming, but to actually be preparing for it, getting ready for it. When you go on a trip, you don't, I mean, unless you're extremely disorganized, you don't pack the moment when you were supposed to be on the plane. You pack before that. You, you get all your arrangements in order. You, like, you want people to go with you? Get them. And, and so it's a call for us to do that, Conscious, consciously, purposefully watching the world around us and, 
and to be awake. And then he says to be sober too. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means what, ha what happens when you're not sober? You don't think clearly. You lack good judgment. Judgment is distorted. What you see and you know, think about is impaired. But when you're sober, you think clear, you have good judgment, and, and he says, let's be like that. That's how we pay attention, with clear, sober thinking. Think about Jesus coming. And he gives two basic ways to do that, to be sober. And these aren't the only ways, but he gives a couple here. He says, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. That kind of reminds us of what it says in Ephesians 6, uh, where he talks about the armor of God. But he tells us here that um, the more we see the day of Jesus coming, the more our lives should be full of faith and full of love. We should be trusting him more and more the more we see the day approaching. And we should love people more and more the more we see. And he says, that will protect our hearts like a breastplate. It'll protect our hearts from strain, from getting twisted, from wanting the wrong things. If you're home and your spouse goes on a trip and, and they're away from you and yet you're like focused, I'm... I'm faithful to my wife even though she's not here. I love her even though she's not here. That guards my heart. That guards how I act even though she's not there. And he says that's how we need to be. As we, that's how, that's how, do you, how we live soberly waiting for his return. And then on top of that, he says, he gives another piece. He says, as a helmet, the hope of salvation the hope of I'm going to be completely saved. I'm in process, but I'll be completely saved with him. That's good for our thinking. That we're truly saved because of what he already did. That protects our head. That protects our mind. It keeps our thinking straight. When I have some kooky idea, and I, but I remember Jesus is coming and he saved me. I'm not going with that idea. That's a stupid idea for somebody who has been saved. It protects our thinking. And so the most sober living we can have is, is and the most uh, sober kind of thinking and living we can do is when we live in faith, trusting him, loving people, loving him, and remembering often I'm saved. I'm saved. That's sober living. Drunken living, distorted living is, man, I got to, you know, I'm going to get it all I can out of this life. Accompl I want to get everything I can. And I'm going to, you know, maybe I'll live to be 90 or whatever if I'm lucky. And I'm going to get all I can, do all I can for me, for my enjoyment, for my pleasure. That's not so, that's twisted thinking. That twists your heart, that twists your mind. But when we live longing for him and the light of his coming, he, it, that guides us, that, that encourages us, that keeps our hearts right, gives our head in the game, and, and it keeps us it, uh, excited, looking forward to it. Some people are terrified when they hear Bible prophecy because a lot of it is scary. But it's not scary if you're saved. It says, he didn't appoint us to wrath. That's why he's rapturing us, by the way. When, when the tribulation period happens, which is described in Revelation 6 to 19, that's the wrath of God on a Christ-rejecting world. And he didn't appoint us to that. He didn't appoint us. So we don't need to be afraid of that. What we see in the world that looks like we're approaching Antichrist means we're, we're approaching the rapture. In the same way that when you start to see Christmas decorations in the store, you know it's almost Thanksgiving, or now it's almost Halloween. Because they put that stuff in there way before anything else. You start seeing a world that looks like it's going towards... A, in, I'm, now I'm kind of just rabbit trail for a second in Revelation, cashless society, one world government, one world religion, you know, all these things, persecution. When you start seeing that, that means it's close to Jesus coming. 
And we see that. We don't need to be afraid. We're not appointed to wrath. So what do we do? He tells us, verse 11, therefore, again, same thing he said at the end of chapter 4, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Just keep doing the good things you know you're supposed to do as a believer. Comfort each other. Encourage each other. Build each other up. And be ready. And, and it's the perfect time to uh, get more acquainted with what are we looking for in the signs of the times. And so that's actually what we're going to do. We're going to, in the coming weeks, we're going to study some passages and, and sections uh, that give us more ideas about the coming of the Lord. And, and the next thing we're going to do starting next week is we're going to just study the whole book of Second Thessalonians. It's three chapters, but there's a lot in it. Because as it says in the passage, this is a subject that we need to know as well as we know the cross. The second coming isn't less important than the first coming. coming. And so, and the, the first coming already happened, and we trust, and we're saved because we believe that. And so now we want to look forward and be ready and eager. Maybe it'll embolden us. Maybe it'll energize us. It should. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you didn't just save us to leave us here. That we're yours, you're preparing a place for us, and that you're coming to take us to be with you always. But you do have us here now. And you said that we're to occupy, we're to keep busy till you come. But we need to be aware of your coming. So Lord, we pray that as we study these things, that we'd believe them with all of our heart, that we'd be as abreast of this truth of your coming as we are of the cross. That you came and you're coming again. And Lord, may these things purify our, li our lives as we know you could come at any time and we want, we want to be found faithful when you come. We want to be found about your business. And so help us, Lord, to believe, to be encouraged, to not have any fear. We're not appointed to wrath. We long for you to come. We pray, as it says in Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And so we love you. Encourage us. Bless your church. Lord, if it's not time for the rapture yet, then we pray you'll give us revival. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, uh, let's stand together and we'll finish up with one last song. I've decided I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning I've decided 
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. 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 Amen. Bless you guys.